concept that is developed called interlocking convergence. And this is basically to looking at where we are in the what my friends in the Kina have called the north, the global north, mm-hmm. and where people are in the global south in terms of resilience to climate change, uh, oil dependency, and how we can transition together away from these areas. And we can we can leave that to to the agenda item if you like at the end. Okay. 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 Many of our great happy days. Okay, we shall be the Okay, Um, my name's Andrew K. Fletcher. Um, like yourself, when Bob Gallagher was around, um, he was Feed the World, I thought there was something inherently wrong with that approach. What we needed to address was the causes of the drought. Yeah. Um, one of my skills is, is, is being a lateral thinker. It's a it's a bit problematic at, at times because it leads you on paths that you never anticipate. Um, when I was a child, I ate some tomatoes which we found growing in a field. Yeah. And those tomatoes, I was informed by my mother, were growing in a sewage bed and they had actually passed through someone's digestive system and sprayed it and no one come to any harm. These, these, these tomatoes were fantastic. The best I'll ever eat. And uh, that memory was imprinted in, 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 in my head uh, and was revived when Bob Geldof alerted the world to, you know, to the famine in Ethiopia and Somalia. And um, to me, uh, again being a lateral thinker, this set me on a, on a the path which uh, has led me to where I am today uh, and what I tried to understand was um, what was causing the drought, why were these people um, having a famine, yeah? why did they need these increasing donations of food, <coughs> couldn't they grow their own food and feed themselves uh, and then you start to put things together, well first of all there is an obvious inherent lack of water you know, which is without water, as you said earlier, we have no life, there is no vegetation, yeah? So, how could we get water onto the land? That was the first problem. Uh, and the second problem was, how can we do it sustainably? In other words, how can we stimulate the rains to fall on a barren land? And, uh, and this led on to the development of Operation Oasis, um, which uh, involved meeting many people, including the Saudi Arabian government, the Kuwait government, the Pakistan government. I won the support of Gideon Zer, the Water Commissioner for Israel. Um, uh, I had many conversations with Dr. El Daz from the Egyptian Embassy. Everyone loved and applauded the project, but of course it was at the time when the focus was very much on everything but the environment. Times have changed. The focus is now on the environment. So, how, how does it all mesh together? Well, first of all, um, we need to get a huge volume of water to the desert shores. You know? um, secondly, we know that, that there is mine water beneath the desert, yeah? and this mine water is being overexploited. Um, uh, the result is that you get salinity. Um, in encroachment in the aquifers, the aquifer becomes poisoned, the water that you put on the soil poisons the surface, the surface soil, and then you have to move elsewhere and start the process all over again. So this clearly isn't a sustainable solution. So what we need is a source of water that is relatively salt free, yeah, so that we don't build up salts too quickly. And a good source of wastewater back to my memory of, of eating those tomatoes, is wastewater. So how do we get the wastewater from the shores of, you know, the, 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 uh, the country that's producing the wastewater, with which, uh, believe me, sewage and wastewater is poured directly into the sea, even in the UK where we boast we are so clean, you know, because of the clean sweep in, in surplus water, uh, and uh, it's banded about that all the solutions are solved. Uh, we still pour in 
uh, untreated wastewater during storms into the sea and we're still pouring that treated effluent which is very valuable water and very valuable nutrients contained within the water directly into the seas and rivers so we have a, an unlimited source of, of wastewater uh, and I find it very difficult to to understand why we would waste the water yeah, when water is so precious um, so how do we get this water to the shores of the desert? Well, to me it was very simple. We've got tankers travelling halfway around the world loaded with seawater as ballast. And they then dump that seawater back into the sea, often introducing invasive species into harbours that, you know, that where we, these, these, these uh, um, species have overtaken the natural, the natural uh, flora and fauna of the ocean. And uh, this, this practice at the moment is due to be legislated against. So the tankers require an alternative to their current practice, which is an unpaid transport of seawater as ballast halfway around the world, yeah? which is absolutely ludicrous. So by substituting that seawater for, uh, for wastewater, treated wastewater, we can now pay these tanker drivers for a return journey paid for by the water companies, hopefully, in the UK, and we can deliver that ballast to a land-based point for disposal, i.e. we irrigate the coastline, we plant trees, we grow crops, and, you know, just like those tomatoes I ate all those years ago, people stop, you know, people stop being hungry, yeah, and people can learn to feed themselves. Um, the nutrients in the wastewater um, are very, very efficient at growing crops. In fact, in, um, there were some experiments done in uh, Italy <coughs> and uh, they watered um, olive trees with wastewater, uh, treated wastewater, and they watered olive trees with the standard water. And they had a 50% increase in the crop yield just by using wastewater as opposed to using clean water, yeah? So we have a very, very powerful plant, plant, um, plant nutrient within that water that's obviously you know, going to increase crop fields. But then I started to ponder, well, what will be the knock-on effect um, if we plant trees along the coastline? What can we expect to happen? Well, I did a lot of digging around, and again, being a lateral thinker, you start to look at the problems, and the problem as I saw it was that the, the, the deserts uh, have coastlines that have been stripped of all vegetation, yes? Now, when you strip um, arid soil of vegetation, the sun's energy quickly heats up that soil, yeah? And that causes, yeah, a thermal, a therm well, what I call a thermal barrier, yeah? It actually puts in place a thermal barrier. And this thermal barrier rises high up into the atmosphere. And if you've ever travelled over one of these coastlines, you can feel the aircraft being muffled in. In fact, all of the migratory birds use this pathway to travel down from Europe down into Africa. Yeah? They can travel many miles without even flapping the wings. So, with this thermal barrier in place, the clouds that, that should be crossing on the ground are simply channeled along the coastline, and they dump their rain in someone else's garden usually causing flash floods and, and mudslides and all sorts of problems because it's in excess. So by planting trees along the, the, uh, the coastline, we're damping down this, this thermal barrier. We're actually making a pathway through so that the clouds can cross onto the land and fall as rain. And I reckon if, if, if we could um, get this pilot project off the ground, we can demonstrate it, and as Craig sure. said, why bother trying to debate, debate what will happen and when it will happen for the next 10 years? Why not plant, plant a forest, plant agroforestry, mm. and demonstrate it and then measure what happens? Yeah? Okay. That's a good point to it. Because uh, you've got some specific. Should we should come back to, to Oasis in detail? And maybe you've got some specific uh, questions, haven't you? Yeah, I was, I was just, in, in, yeah, I was just in, interested to know. Do you use any environmental restoration techniques such as earthworks to hold the water onto the land? Uh, we have, we have, what we've done so far, 
that eliminates some of the issues we, we have what you call land reclamation techniques yeah, because some of these um, the degradation that some of this land has been subjected to over the years makes growing of anything almost impossible so we, we get involved in I don't know if how much you know land reclamation we get involved in a, a land reclamation engineering but now going back to get to some of the issues you mentioned in this report here I have talked about bringing clean water from both the Atlantic and the Mediterranean and I build a plant, major plant. Mm -hmm. so, yeah. But of course this whole issue that you're this new mm -hmm. innovation is a uh, different one. And um, quite is something that is worth looking into. Because in this paper I have gone on to talk about the underground mm -hmm. water that exists in the area that I have checked through the various meteorological institutions and I know there is some kind of uh, water sufficient but how sufficient we don't know that is one of that I have also mentioned that there is a need to carry out some further investigation because the cost <coughs> of doing it comprehensive survey to determine the, the aquifer that you need is expensive and that you couldn't afford it. So I did mention it here yeah, and, and I was pleased to find that USCC is a very keen on knowing that as well. But having said that, the quickest, what I said that if you depend on the underground aquifer, you run the risk of exhausting mm -hmm. the water without replenishing. Because the only way you can replenish is through rainfall by growing trees. Mm -hmm. If you grow the trees, rain will fall. Okay. Because in some of the areas, they don't have rain. Sometimes one in six years, sometimes one in four years. Could I just interrupt you? Yeah. Um, in, in China, the, 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 there's been a, a huge planting of trees, and what they found is because they hadn't got a strategy for planting those trees, yes. in fact they hadn't identified or made the identification that the moisture comes from the, from the sea to the land, yeah, these trees have dried up and, and uh, they've become dead. Yeah, I, I went to Gobi, I went to China, I saw quite a number of their pilot projects in the entire country. So, so the question now is, how fast are you going to grow the tree? Are, are the trees going to be uh, come to a stage enough to bring the rainfall that will replenish the other groundwater that you're going to? Uh, my answer is very unlikely. Very unlikely because talking about coastline, if you look at Morocco, Algeria, and Tunisia, that. You know, do you know that Algeria has lost 80% of the land in the middle? We only have 20% now. Yeah. So, so, because the, going back to that question about land reclamation and the system of, because if you don't find a way of reclaiming the lands that are suffering under heavy degradation, they very little they can do, they cannot hold anything, they cannot, because it's all custom. And, uh, and, and the, so, I mean, the the sand you know, if you look at the desert and see the level of uh, movement of uh, the, the, the amazing to do. So, uh, which is why this is of so much interest. But, to answer the other question you, you raised, which is what we have done in, um, sorry, which is something we have done, is pilot project. That is the mm -hmm. only way you, in fact, but until my pilot project started yielding results, it was supposed to get funded. Mm -hmm. Chicken and the engine. <coughs> because there is essentially anything to do with Africa, there is transparency problem, there is governance problem. 
és a pályázatnál ő volt egy nagyjára katonás pályázat, hogy most lett olyan, és nem alkár, hogy ott lennek, ha ott lennek, hogy ott lennek, hogy ott lennek. Hát ez a hangció, hát ők a hasonlítatás is elhetszik. Hangció a ögúcsú demonstrációt. And this is what I have to do because in Makoda we are going to be our pilot project. It was uh, uh, we have photographs of what it, the desert that it was before we moved in in 1994. And what we have there now is two supports. And and I, I use the wall of tree arrangement that we have in Israel also because of my my uh, And this, this was a, a community that had migrated out of the area because of that. In fact, when we got to the state, and we said to them, this is what we want to do. Give us an area you think they, they pushed us thinking that, okay, you go there and see. And it was, it was like a mission impossible. Uh, so we, we started our reclamation to drill bubbles. And we started building wall of trees and within a few years, greenery. Because it's not just the trees you plant, it's what the trees will bring. Because the best will come. And when the best come, they bring a lot of things to that you, you don't expect. Right. So the whole area now, in fact, you will, when you see the photographs of Makoda, when we got there in 1994, sorry, 2004, and see the area today, there is no way you can reconcile with you. No way. Because the communities have, are now migrating back to their original homeland. Mm. Which takes the pressure yeah, off the Rain system. is now mm. coming, mm. and then I have rainfall. And you know something? The community builds me a hope, a house. Because, you know, <coughs> I used to stay in, uh, in my tent. I would go there and, you know, because we, you bring in hundreds of people to help you, mainly school children and volunteers. And the only way you can uh, get them to appreciate is to live with them. So, so I would take my tent there and I'll come there sometimes for days and weeks with them, uh, you know, not sure in the situation, uh, looking at they're doing land pollution. So, uh, let me try and see if I can find something that I'm to show with you. Mr. Craig, I don't have any questions you want to do now. Okay. Okay. So let's do one to go for the dialogue for a little bit. Please do. Uh, I'm, I'm curious on who you are. Yes. Just your three organizations. I've only read about the uh, professional. Yes. Yeah. 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 Well, self-funded. Yeah, it, it is self-funded. Yeah. I, I mean, certainly for the Free Dome Visionary Trust, um, we used to run youth events, yeah. uh, which actually brought in some funding as a safety event, which yeah. actually spread the message a little bit. But at the moment, it's, uh, yeah. it, it, there is no inconstraint at the moment. Yeah. We're applying for funding, okay. and we want to connect it to the resource okay. safety okay. service. This is the house of the Oh, thank <laughs> <laughs> you. know, the wind. Came and yeah. blew off the roof. Not too long ago, but they have replaced. They will replace the roof without telling me. <laughs> this is very interesting. <laughs> okay. Planted my first tree. I must have been about twelve years of age. That tree is still there to this day. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. 
When you talk of sustainable water, yeah. uh, very crucial. Yes. Um, if there's anything one can do without tampering with the, 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 the on the ground water, okay. it would go that way. Not only that, I have also found out that the on the ground water is becoming very acidic. Right, because of the, you know, most of the real water is and with the climate change situation and the um, rain now becoming very, the rain water becoming very acidic, beginning to affect the underground uh, water, which like 15, 20 years ago was the most natural water you can find in the Chile in Africa, you know, it doesn't drink anything like that. But today you can do that. Mm. Mm. Because of pollution. Mm. Mm. Okay. What, what species? This one are name trees. Name trees. Yeah. We are introducing name. We are introducing. See, the good thing about name is we, we have actually gone ahead now to build a cottage industry. Because the seed from Nim went across. I don't know if you've heard of Nim oil. Yes, yes, I yes. have. Yes. Yes. That's quite expensive in the UK. Yeah. Uh, we are actually making some Nim oil. We call it feed Nim oil. Yes. You can make oil from it. And the bad product from making the oil you can do detergents and so on. So mm. you, have a, you have an industry already. Uh, Is that uh, like uh, the soap nuts? That's right, yeah. The same with the, which we use for pencil at the moment, the uh, jacrofa. You can also use jacrofa. The only thing about jacrofa, the good thing about jacrofa is that it, it cannot easily be invaded by uh, grazing animals because it must have this one uh, so, But jacrofa too has a lot of. Uh, you can get into a virus. So it's uh, uh, the good thing about growing the tree in the market. So uh, in a five, ten, fifty years, the level of industry that you can develop, in addition to building and then giving people employment, the industry you can develop from such initiatives. And the, the, the not industry, the, the, the uh, machines we are using to crush and make oil were fabricated in Nigeria by the by the coal scientists. So you don't really, it's not so, well, I mean, you can get better ones from, from here and from China, but the ones we are using at the moment are, were fabricated in Nigeria. Okay. Right. So we go on to the next item. Yes, I suppose is um, the, 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 my 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 particular uh, perspective and angle on this, as I say, is the European and the international perspective. Mm -hmm. And what I'm very keen to do through the Freedom of Visionary Trust is to uh, communicate uh, throughout the international community why uh, combating desertification is important and why it actually affects people even if they're far away from deserts. I think it's nothing to do with them. Yeah. And I'm also very interested in um, helping to release co-funding from the international community uh, to, you know, to finance, um, you know, the fighting the encroachment of deserts, mm -hmm. and in fact, to to, to, um, uh, you know, to reverse the process of that. And uh, and I mean, what, what I think the, the key uh, European perspective is, it, it, it actually revolves around carbon. Because oh, yeah. people are not, uh, as I say, a lot of people you say to them, you talk to them about deserts and say, what's that got to do with me? But as soon as you start talking about carbon, then suddenly they become interested. Um, but of course, the thing is that whenever I you know, address a conference and I ask people the question, what converts carbon, uh, carbon dioxide or carbon emissions into carbon resources, like food and fuel and eco friendly materials, nobody knows. Yeah? You know, um, it's because people haven't made that link, and of course, the link is vegetation, isn't it? 
Uh, so, you know, so at the moment, you know, we talk about uh, you know slowing down carbon emissions, and now we're talking about sequestration. But uh, but no one is really talking about turning those carbon emissions back into the resources that we're running out of. You see, yeah, yeah. and that is something that does introduce. Yeah, in fact, these days all they're talking about is carbon credits. That's uh, what they're yeah, doing. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Oh, come on, come on, come on. They they haven't gotten to this. Uh, yeah, oh, no, that's carbon right. tax. Yeah, yeah. 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 The, the penny hasn't dropped. They haven't made yeah. that link. <laughs> but once they do make that link, and they realise that we actually need to, uh, you know, to, to restore the world's vegetation. And that the way to do that is 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 by combating desertification and making use of uh, this of this land that's arid. Then suddenly they will become interested, I believe. Um, and uh, it's, it's interesting that uh, one of these books, you, you know, um, James Shelton Douglas, if you read any of his work, see he see he points out that um, at the moment, actually this is ha- at his time, it's probably got worse now. That uh, at the moment, only about eight percent of the world's land is productive and cultivated, uh, whereas it could be as much as 75%. Um, and that if you, um, uh, you know, if instead of growing our current monocultures, uh, you, um, you, you, you introduce agroforestry, then you can actually multiply the productivity of the land uh, by as much as tenfold. So if you've got ten times as much land being ten times as productive, then the world can effectively become a hundred times as fruitful. Yes, and you can capture all that uh, the, all, all those carbon emissions and turn them into productive vegetation. Um, so, 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 so when I try to explain this to people in, in European and international circles, then we say that, that you know, we agree we've got too much carbon in the air, running out of food and fuel and carbon resources, plants turn what we don't want into what we do want, but most of the world is wasteland, so therefore we need to, uh, com- you know, to reclaim the wasteland in order to scale up the vegetation um, and then you can convert what we don't want into what we do. Uh, now, yes, uh, yes, some sort of. Yes, I suppose that's what I'm saying is that what we're the approach that we're talking about can actually unite um, a lot of people's perspectives. That, that's what I'm all about. Isn't it? About mm-hmm. uh, people uniting on their on their common ground and working together to, to solve our shared problems in you know from our own viewpoint. And uh, and this sort of approach, you know, it can uh, it can unite, for example, you know, the the climate skeptics, yes, and the climate enthusiasts. The climate skeptics will say, oh, you know, you know, CO2 isn't isn't the the cause of, of climate change, uh, but because that doesn't really matter, because if we if we all agree, we all do agree that uh, levels of carbon in the air have gone up 40 percent since pre-industrial times, and we're running out of our carbon resources. Therefore, whatever people think about climate change, it does make sense to convert that into that, so you can unite those two parties. Um, and then similarly in an international context, uh, where you've got, uh, you know, the, I suppose at the moment you've got the division between the MEDCs and the LEDCs, and so the less developed, um, econ- economically developed countries um, are obviously saying to the, and rightly so, to the more um, economically developed countries, saying, well, you need to cut your carbon emissions, they're causing us problems, and of course we need help. Uh, financial help in order to um, yeah, in order to adapt. To the point, yeah. Whereas, if the if we could put a solution on the table where everyone benefits, where we say, okay, so if the um, MEDCs help the LEDCs uh, to uh, cultivate their arid land, yes, then they will be absorbing our carbon emissions, yes, and building their economies by putting back onto the world market renewable economic supplies of the resources that our communities and um, industries are running out of, the food, the fuel and the eco-friendly materials. Yes, so, so, so what I believe is we can put a, a solution on the table where everyone agrees that it is uh, you know, to, to their advantage. I mean? and so, so that's the sort of message that I would like to bring to the international community because I believe it's something that everyone can buy into. And that's a message I, I, would, I would love to be able to deliver. Um, and uh, you know, if, if you, I was mentioning earlier about um, Anna Seven Suzuki. You must be actually sitting there when she gave her speech. Yes, so, do, you, do you remember that? Yes. 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 Uh, at the moment, you know, because she said things like, uh, she said things like, didn't she, in her speech, that uh, you know, the, the amount that the world spends at the moment on, you know, on um, arms and on yes, uh, yes. and on warfare. If that money was diverted into, you know, finding and implementing environmental solutions, 
uh, what a different place this world could be, you see. So, so as well as, you see, as I say, I want to help release the funding uh, to combat desertification, and some of that can be in terms of private investment and in terms of international grants. But what I'd love to see happening would be for, um, you know, for there to be a universal declaration that uh, climate change and resource depletion are universal threats uh, to national security, yeah. because they will they will cause conflict. I think they are causing conflict, as you say. Um, so and, and if that were the case, and if we recognise as a threat, then the way that all defence uh, departments work is that once a year they look at the threat to national security and they define tasks to combat those. So if we so if climate change and um, resource depletion and desertification, which is driving both of those, are seen as um, threats to national security then the armed forces would actually be beginning to identify tasks to take on, constructive tasks, to actually attack those problems instead of attacking each other. And perhaps uh, humanity could say, well, OK, we're all in the same boat, we're facing the same problems, so let's cut scale back on fighting a while and solve our common problems, and then we can fight over what's left. But of course, once you start getting international teamwork and people are working on constructive um, uh, projects together, then of course that reduces both the need for conflict and the causes of conflict. Mm-hmm. Yeah, the problem we have, or that mm-hmm. we all share, is um, the, the, the big interest groups that are, you know, I mean, when you talk about conflict, mm-hmm. and the amount of money you spend in fighting for this conflict, Somewhere down the line, the defense industry that are littered all over the world that are producing all of the bombs and bombs are going to start getting worried because when you want to start having less conflict, they are yeah, 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 so so far, and it will obviously drop completely. Uh, the Wall Street and the financial institutions are working in place. I mean, when you see it, the way it happens is that the moment you begin to have um, elements of peace in any uh, conflict area, the share price of the defense industry <laughs> begins to drop. <laughs> and somewhere down the line, somebody's going to fight in the same way. So that's the same thing is happening, uh, which was why America for a long time did not tie into not just America, most of the industrialized countries which used to initial the uh, Kyoto Protocol. Mm-hmm. And I think we're still having the same problem because I was in Copenhagen and Cancun. And I saw the the interest groups, the, the way they work, the way they are going about mm-hmm. emission reduction and uh, a lot of them are even prepared to put money into carbon trade than cut back <coughs> on their emission or, you know, which is actually where I think we can be looking at. Because I have found that um, with the adaptation policy and the mitigation policy of the United Nations, which has been very well articulated, most of us are beginning to agree that yes, you must allow the development to continue because of what uh, the negative effect it will have on so many things if the United Nations don't continue with the development. But China, for instance, India, Brazil, is <coughs> developing countries that say, okay, is it because the Americans in Europe have reached the pinnacle of their development. And I want to stop us from here. So one is the one is being boxed to a space now where it would mm-hmm. some of us are saying, okay, fine. You can go ahead with your admission level. But put aside something for mitigation. Mm-hmm. Put aside. And that's the area where one should be looking at. Mm-hmm. Resolution. Resolution, yes, yes. 
Because if they say, okay, I mean, I think America is ready, China also is ready to put aside the huge amount of money to to kind of uh, trees that will make rain to fall. Uh, I mean, when you say that it's better to be budget that in the world, you have to have to be there. I mean, people can buy into things like that. And, uh, uh, so and that is where the funding, which uh, I'm glad that some of you are going to talk about, because um, uh, we mustn't underestimate the, the, uh, the level that interest groups can go, mm-hmm. uh, especially when you come into those arenas that I, I don't know, where you copy it? No, 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 no. Yeah, I saw them at you know at work, and uh, uh, sometimes it's very disgusting, mm-hmm. uh, which is why I'm been debating with myself whether I should go to the next, which is a kind of the next uh, climate change conference, because the. Interest groups have a lot of money. Mm. Yeah, the lobby groups are so powerful. And sometimes dangerous. Mm-hmm. Uh, Could I just change the battery? Yeah, yeah. Because yeah. 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 it, it's going to. Uh, it's just how bad it's on record. <laughs> mm-hmm. It's a difficult end of doing that, then you get them to talk about.